Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Tortoisea, Westphalia, Paris, Vienna. Do you know what all these places have in common? A few history buffs out there, maybe you're thinking to yourself, this is the place where peace treaties were signed. You're right. Those are locations where men found peace, where, where two parties of men were conflicting and at those places they resolved them. They had reconciliation between one another. There was peace. And those aren't the only cities where peace treaties have been signed. There's been many peace treaties, but the truth is, as you and I both know every time we turn on the news, is that um, we still need to find peace, don't we? What is it, seven days ago? Not so much that long ago, but in Las Vegas there was chaotic events. Things that really could have used some peace. Things that teach us that we really need, and there still is a need, to be reconciled to God. And the truth is, is as we listen to our lesson this morning, we see a wonderful, wonderful message from Paul. And the message that he tells us this morning is that we have reconciliation. And it changes us. And it's from God. Now if you were to open up the Bibles that are in your, your pews in front of you and you were to flip it open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you'd look and you'd see our lesson, but you'll notice that it starts in the middle of a section kind of. It, it, it's, it comes right after Paul has been talking about how the love of Christ impacts people. Um, right before this, Paul says something along the line of um, Christ's love compels us to live not for ourselves, but to live for the one who died for us. And so we have to kind of have that in mind, that, that when Paul starts speaking here, he's talking about people who have been impacted by the love of Christ. And this is the very first verse from our lesson. Paul says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And what Paul is saying is that the love that Christ has for us, it impacts us. And it causes us to see the world in a different way. It causes us to see the world the way that God sees the world. And not just the world, but the people who are in the world. We see them in a different way too. We no longer place value on people the way that the world places value on people. We no longer look to people's value in the color of their skin, in, in the education that they have, in the occupation that they hold, in the way that they talk, or even the last name that they have. Those are ways of the world. But we look and view people the way that God wants us to view people. We view people as souls whom God died for. We look at them and see them as people who need the message of Jesus Christ, their Savior. Because when people see and believe the message of Jesus, something amazing happens. Paul goes on to say this. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Anyone who hears the message of Jesus and believes it to be true, believes Jesus to be their Savior from sin, there's a new creation in them. And both of those words are really kind of important to focus on, right? New and creation, they both mean something. New, meaning it wasn't there before. Creation, meaning it's something that has to be brought about or, or made. And what we see is that's the work of God in us. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and the word that God speaks to us, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and creates a new self inside of us. A new self that, well, is, is willing to listen to God's word. It, it hears God's law and says, I want to do this. Not because I have to, but because I want to. To thank God my Savior, I want to listen to what he has to say. And as we look at our own actions and our words, you might see Paul's words and you might say, yeah, I, Paul's right. There is a new creation in every believer, but the truth is when Paul says the old is gone, it's, 
It's really not gone all that far, is it? Our old sinful self is still right there with us. Right there with us looking to sabotage the new creation. Looking to take control. To lead us into sin. I don't think it takes very much for us to realize that. How many of us in here haven't done exactly what Paul says we're not to do, which is to judge people based upon worldly things? How many of us in here haven't seen someone and, and, and judged on the basis of maybe their skin color, their clothes, their occupation, their education, and said, they're not worth it? That's because our sinful heart longs to judge people according to the world standards. Because when it does that, then it finds a place where it can justify itself. It finds a place where it can start to point out all the flaws of everyone else and then raise its own self up. Well, this was great, but really you, you didn't do it all the way. You didn't complete it. And the only reason why you did that is because this person told you to do so. Tearing other people down. Or, you know, look at this. This is what I did earlier. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, I know I didn't do this, but that's because, uh, you know, this happened. So it's not really my fault. I didn't do it. Building ourselves up. That is our sinful flesh at work. And it is capable of some terrible, terrible things. Because it longs to oppose God. It wages war against God and everything that God has in store. And you need only to turn on the news to see really the sinful nature at its finest. And I really mean at its worst. Las Vegas. Some of us think to ourselves, how could someone do something like that? Well, your sinful nature. Look inside. Your sinful nature is capable of dangerous things. It opposes God and everything that God would want to happen. And when left unchecked, it runs wild. And some of the most dangerous things that our sinful nature tries to convince us of is to see Jesus the way the world sees Jesus. That's the way Paul saw Jesus at one time in his life, right? Paul says in our, in our lesson, he says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. See, Paul was a Jew at one time. He was a Pharisee. And when he saw Jesus, he saw Jesus not as his Savior from sin, but he saw Jesus only as a man. And sometimes our sinful heart likes to buy in to that type of a lie. That Jesus really isn't my Savior from sin because I'm not really all that bad. But he did, he did come and teach some really great stuff about how to love your neighbor and to put others first. Our sinful nature tries to convince us of that. Or it goes the opposite way and tries to tell you that, well, Jesus did die on the cross for some people's sins. He didn't die on the cross for my sins. At least not my really big ones. Or he didn't die to pay for those sins that I continue to fall into. Those sins that I don't want to do, but yet time and time and time again I fall into them. My sinful nature, along with the lie of the devil, says, well, God doesn't forgive you for those because you're not worthy of his forgiveness. That's what our sinful heart tries to tell us. And it does those things because it is, it is at war with God. It's at war with our new man and it is at war with God. And as we look at our thoughts and our actions, we realize that we need to find some reconciliation. We need some type of peace between us and God. And as we listen to what Paul has to say next, we find it. We find the message of reconciliation. Paul goes on to say this in our lesson. He says, All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. But don't misunderstand what Paul's saying. In all of those places before, Tordesilla, Westphalia, Vienna, Paris, all of those were places where men came and they 
were two parties going back and forth saying, this is what I would want for peace, this is what I would want for peace, until they have finally arrived on a treaty. That's not the way our God works. Our God, through His grace, reconciled us solely through the work of Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that we have been reconciled. And Paul goes on to make that point even more clear when he says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And there in that section of Scripture, you really have the basic understanding of the way that our relationship with Christ works. What do we bring to our relationship with Christ? Sin. And what does God do for us? And what does He give to us through Christ? Righteousness. There is nothing that we do that causes God's favor on us. God just loves us through Christ. He sent His Son to die for us so that we could be reconciled, so we could be at peace, so that we could stand before God justified. Think of it like this. And you tell me if you'd keep this type of a friend. Let's say you have a friend. They're really not much of a friend at all, but let's say you have a friend. And when you meet together, um, they really don't care to listen to you talk. They really don't care about your opinions. And when you meet together, you, they're very condescending. They have only bad things to say about you. Uh, and when you meet together, they, they, really, they really don't want you to have a say in the friendship or the relationship at all, but rather they'd really like to make all the choices. Um, and, and when you meet together, they usually show up late because, hey, they're only worried about themselves. How many of you would keep that friend? How many of you would say, oh, yeah, I think I would like to have a relationship with that person? Probably none of us. I know I wouldn't want to have a relationship with someone like that. And so it baffles us that God in His grace would look at each and every single one of us and say, yeah, I want a relationship with that person. Because when in our sinful flesh, by nature, we wanted nothing to do with God. We cared nothing of His Word. We only cared about ourselves. And yet God in His love sent His Son Jesus to shed His blood for our sins. For all those sins to where we judge people according to the standards of the world. For all those times that our sinful flesh justifies itself. For all those times that we were selfish and boastful. For all those times that we lusted after something that God said we should not have. God took those sins and placed them on the one who knew no sin. And Jesus shed his blood in payment for your sins. So that there could be peace. So that there would be no more struggle between you and God. So that when God looked at you, he would see his son or daughter. And when we realize that that's what God has done for us, when we realize that it's through God's grace that we have been saved through Christ, we do exactly what Paul says. We, we, we open our mouth. We become what Paul says. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And Paul is saying, when he's saying be reconciled, he's saying just trust God's promises. Trust in Jesus as your Savior from sin. When you do that, then you can't help but want to tell people the, the wonderful thing that our God has done for us. And as ambassadors of Christ, we, we don't make up some kind of cleverly crafted pitch. We don't, we don't make up this story that's supposed to hook people in. We just speak the truth. We tell them what God has done for us. We say, I was a poor, miserable sinner. And yet God, in His grace and in His love, sent His Son to die for me. And now I have become an heir of righteousness. Now I stand next to God without any strife, without any struggle, because of the blood of Jesus. We have reconciliation. And it changes us. And it is from God. You think of all those places, Tordesilla, 
Australia, Vienna, Paris. You think about all those places and what an amazing amount of peace was brought about at those places. But the truth is, is it fails in comparison to the one place where true peace can be found. The mountain of Calvary. Where God reconciled the world to Himself through Christ, not counting your sins, my sins, the whole world's sins against themselves. We have been reconciled to God. Look to Jesus to find your peace. Look to Jesus to find your hope for an eternal life. And look to Jesus for the strength to go out and to be Christ's ambassadors. Amen. Please stand.